Greetings, everybody, and welcome to a new podcast with me and Aaron. This podcast is called The Listening Eye, Trusting the Secret Feminine Within. And really what we want to do with this podcast is bring different type of understanding and energy of the feminine pieces of all of us. My channel, many of the things that I do is very male focused. Um, there are other parts of me and of, of other people. But before we dive into today's conversation, Aaron, will you introduce yourself? Hi, everyone. So um, my name is Erin Dubose, and I'm currently uh, a stay-at-home mom, but I am also um, going to start a, a doctoral program uh, in philosophy in the fall with a uh, perspective in women's spirituality. So I wanted to, you know, get a head start on that and talk about the sacred feminine, how we can embody it more in our um, everyday life and kind of like what it is and kind of um, just get a feel for what we may not know that we need to do and kind of what we can do to balance ourselves out to live a more happy and peaceful life. Absolutely. And we need it. We all need it because we do have this duality and this piece of us. So I'm going to just put this out there now and just start calling you Dr. DeBose. Yeah. Uh, so just so I know it's probably going to be about four or five years ahead of time, yeah, it's gonna be a while. But, we, but, but it's OK. <laughs> we're going we're gonna to put that out in the atmosphere now. To make sure you cross that finish line for sure. So tell us a little bit more about this concept uh, and what are some of the principles of the feminine pieces within ourselves? Okay, so the sacred feminine is basically an embodiment of um, a couple of different things. Like when you think about feminine or you think about feminine energy, most people think about just uh, a woman, but that doesn't necessarily mean that um, a woman is all feminine. We obviously know that we're made up of masculine and feminine qualities, but the sacred feminine, anyways, the bullet points for the sacred feminine is um, nurturing, uh, intuition, compassionate, unconditional love, uh, receptivity, um, just all these things that you would kind of think of when you think of a mother, like, uh, and men and females represent this, but I feel like, I think this is a very important topic to talk about because a lot of our society is uh, very patriarchal or they teach us that we should really focus on the action part of our uh, energies, which is masculine action is all about, you know, how you pick up your gun or whatever. And that's very masculine sure. or, you know, jump starting something is very masculine, but kind of taking your time and understanding and going with the flow of um, the other half, I kind of wanted to talk about because I feel like as uh, people, we don't really embody these things. And we kind of, and now that we're in a digital age, we don't we necessarily don't slow down. I mean, I feel like the digital age in itself is pretty masculine, so. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Okay. Well, there's a good explanation of it. I agree with you. Um, I think that uh, there's been people over time, uh, one person that comes to mind just from my psychology bias is Carl Jung. And Jung, if, for folks that don't know, he kind of, he ran with Sigmund Freud. Most people have heard of Freud or Freudian slips. Freud's like the godfather of psychology. But if they had like a Mount Rushmore of psychology, Freud would be on that. Um, Freud, uh, Carl Jung, probably B.F. Skinner. These are a bunch of old white dudes that most people have no idea who they are, but they have influenced so much psychologically that their learnings have been part of a lot of our lives. Even people like uh, Pavlov. Um, many people have probably heard of like Pavlov's dog experiment, but that that understanding, that learning that took place during that time has been influenced in media, it's been influenced in our school systems, all these things that shape and shift how we operate as a people, especially here in the United States. So when I, when I think about the secret feminine, it takes me to Carl Jung, because one of, one of the things that Jung talked about was the animus and the anima. And a good way for people to kind of think of these two principles is like yin and yang. So if you've ever seen the yin and yang symbol, um, they're supposed to represent kind of a masculine entity and a feminine entity and how these two things intertwine and how they're within us and create this balance amongst us. Jung had a similar philosophy um, that he pretty much adapted from studying ancient Asian cultures and things of that nature anyway. Uh, like a lot of these things, they, they, they go to other countries, learn some stuff, then flip it into their own linguistics and understandings. Um, but Jung talks about the anima and animus, and the anima is the more female principle, and the animus is the more masculine principle. And one of the things that he theorized on is when these two things are out of sync with one another, that's when you start to see a lot of dysregulation or even sometimes stresses and mental health issues amongst people. 
And I think that in modern day times, you know, when it comes to thinking about our feminine selves and our masculine selves, one of the things that has gotten messed up with, uh, with that thought process is we've gotten so um, stuck on putting it into a gender context or a sexuality context. So when it comes to men and talking about the feminine elements up within ourselves, we automatically assume that we're identifying as gay. And that's not true. And when it comes to the masculine elements and we're talking about females, we start to say, okay, they're trying to be lesbians or butchers and all this other types of things like that. But that's not necessarily true. We have both of these principles because we come from both men and women. And that's how we end up becoming our, the beings that we are ourselves. So I just wanted to add that psychological concept to this to really tee up this podcast and this conversation that we're going to have today. So I'm going to pass it over to you. I know you got some questions that we're going to pose. Um, so feel free to let it rip. Yeah, I just wanted to add to um, what you were just talking about is that I think that it's very vital that our community in specific speak about this because we have been pushed into an imbalance of these energies. Absolutely. And and not necessarily, um, and I don't know if we're conscious of it and not necessarily that it's a bad thing to embody a masculine energy when you need to, but just to keep it going, sometimes it's kind of... Uh, it's not fair to your being. It's not fair to who you are as a person. So I just wanted to, you know, say that yeah. and state that. And um, yeah, so I do have some questions and I kind of want to just get this conversation going and um, talk about it specifically from a perspective of school, because mm -hmm. I feel like the American school system and maybe just Western school system in itself is very uh, heavily masculine dominated and uh, patriarchal. So I just wanted to kind of see you know, we can come up with some examples of the sacred feminine when we went to school or uh, any of our school experiences with our teachers, administrators, um, college professors, anything like that. So I wanted to get started on that. Okay. Yeah. Okay. You ready? Mm -hmm. I'm ready to rock and roll. <laughs> okay. Okay. So my first question is, who did you witness if you did tap into the embodiment of the sacred feminine? Like, and that's within elementary school, middle school, high school, or college. Yeah, I'm going to try to answer this question on each one of those levels. Okay. Because um, I think it shifts and changes as you go up. So when I think about those principles that you listed out, nurturing, uh, receptivity, creativity, compassion, uh, intuition, on an elementary school level, I would say a lot of my teachers would have expressed that. Um. I think about, I, like, I remember my kindergarten teacher, Mrs. Anderson, she was a white woman. Uh, I remember her having a lot of compassion for kids. And and I remember when when there was ever, she used to do this thing where we would all just like sit down, crisscross applesauce. That's where, I, you know, some people say Indian style. I know that that is not the thing to say, but she <laughs> taught us crisscross applesauce. And I remember, uh, I remember us learning that and her deliberately telling us not to say sit down Indian style. And I remember her saying, that's a bad thing to say. You need to learn. We, we sit crisscross applesauce in our classroom. So I thought that that was her way of showing compassion and also being forward thinking, because this is in like 1992 or something. Yeah, when was I about five years old? Yeah, it's like 92, 91. And she's already thinking in her mind how, where we're at today around like culture, race and things of that nature. So I think that for her, that was a, a display of that for all these kids to say, listen, we're not going to sit up here talking about sitting Indian style. We're going to sit up here and talk about, we sit crisscross applesauce. And it was just one of those things that she instilled in us to the point now as an adult, I say the same things to my kids. Like when I'm asking them to sit down and listen, focus, I'm like, all right, sit on the floor, sit down, crisscross applesauce. And I've kind of carried that from what I learned when I was like five, six years old. So that would be on that level. I think on the high school, or sorry, the middle school level, the person that comes to mind for me would have been um, a teacher that I'm actually still connected with. His name is Mitch McDonald. Um, his dad is like a local legend. His dad's name is Clyde McDonald. I give those two men a lot of credit um, because the compassion the, the intuition, the intuitiveness of the community is something that they both uh, carried, even, even his mom too, even though she doesn't get all the credit. But that family, the three of them have really been a staple in, in the black community here in the Twin Cities, as far as understanding that education is important and, and valuing youth and valuing the development of young people. And I always found that um, extremely important. But one thing that Mitch did for me 
you know, even when we think about this, like mystery and renewal um, and creativity, Mitch used to run, he used to run the yearbook, uh, which was kind of strange because you, well, he didn't run the yearbook, he was a part of that process. But he had this class that everybody always wanted to take. I don't even remember the name of the class, but all the students would always want to get into one of Mitch's classes. And I remember we were doing this exercise and he would, he had like wrote on the board, how do you want to be remembered? And each one of us, he didn't want us to share with the whole class. He, we would get caught on when we were like, it was, it was like the, we all had a day, like, like six students every day would have to go up and talk to him about how we wanted to be remembered. And I remember I was not prepared. It was my day. <laughs> so I'm waiting for him to call my name. And then he calls my name and I walk up to him. And I'm like, damn, Brandon, like, you didn't do your assignment. Like you slacking, bro. Like, what are you going to do? I'm talking in my head. Like, what am I going to do? And I get up there and I just say the first thing that comes to my mind. And he said, how do you want to be remembered, Brandon? And I said, by writing a book, because when people write books, people remember them. And he said, that's great. He said, I can't re read your book. Now, I'm thinking like, I just made this up. But now I got this additional pressure like oh I got to get this done and even to this day I, I stay in, like I said I stay in contact with him he's always like I'm waiting on that book man you got all them degrees where that book at like he remembers that so it was like it was like an additional value that came from another black man and for, for folks who follow me for quite some time I've, I've openly shared like I've always had issues with black men like this trusting thing due to the dynamics with my stepfather and my biological father so he was really like the first black dude that I actually like listen to that wasn't a coach like I wasn't playing football it was just somebody that like I listened to about life and and that outside of my my grandfather he'd be the other person um I think that that's that feminine principle is being invested into the development of a young person as you said in this patriarchal system that we are in um and some would say the black community has a a, a messed up kind of dynamic and I would agree it's more gynocentric which we'll talk about at a whole another time but when it comes to living in this society that is supposed to be patriarch patriarchal, but as a black man, we don't have the same privileges. We have some of them, but we don't have the same privileges as other males do because our community functions a little bit different. The, re the relationships that we build with other men is usually suspicious or it's very surface. And Mitch was one of the first people to model that it didn't have to be surface. Like it could be a lot deeper than just, you know, you know, how, how did the, how did the Vikings do? Or, you know, did you watch the Timberwolves game last night or whatever? It wasn't none of that. It was like, how are you developing as a young person? And I thought that that was that caring piece that I didn't see in a lot of men, but I always resonate and relate to with him. Um, for high school, I can't, man, I can't think of any school professionals. Um, I could probably think of more like friends and peers. I think I, I built a really good friend group in high school. I was the dude, and I talked about this too, I always masked my identity. I was really a nerd from pretty much seventh grade on, but I played football and I was good enough. I was like the captain of the football team, all that type of stuff. So I was good enough where people didn't really like even question my intellectual ability. They didn't really care because I was a football player. So, <laughs> so I would be cool with people that share similar interests as me. I'd be cool with the athletes I'd be cool with the people who are funny. I'd be cool with the people who are freestyling in the hallway. Yeah, I'd be no cool man. with the anime. Yeah, and, and everybody would just know I'm just a cool dude. I'd be cool with the chicks. I'd be cool with everybody. And that was done deliberately because I had so many different interests. I never wanted to get like put in one particular area. But there's one particular group of just eclectic beings <laughs> that were all together. And, um, you know, one of the dudes is my best friend, to, or one of my best friends today. I got two best friends. And he was always into like drawing and photography and he would draw on tennis shoes and stuff like that. And I always felt like he cared about people. And, um, and we would have these friends. Like we have, we had one friend who was this Asian dude, long hair, like the dance, uh, ended up coming out that he was gay later. We had another, we had another dude who ended up just like disappearing in California. Like we had all these dudes that were part of this little friend group, but we were all cool. We would go out to eat. We would talk, listen to music, just hang out, whatever. And I thought that that was a, a way for us to not fit that stereotype of what we were supposed to be as right. black men, minus that Asian dude. But, you know, as black or even men, him or even yeah, him. even him. Yeah. Because, again, we were just being who we were naturally. And everybody just knew we were cool. It wasn't about I mean, I would go to dances with them or, or if I if I went with somebody else, I would just go hang out with them for a little bit, then go back to the group I came with, whatever. And it was just a fact that we all just vibed on a particular creative level. And that's just what we did. 
And I don't think that that always gets respected in our community because those usually those types of individuals are seen as weird or those types of individuals are seen as quote unquote gay, right? Even though we did have a gay dude in the group, the rest of us it wasn't gay. But that, right. but that, but that, but see, in our community, we don't allow for any type of other identities outside of these ones that have been kind of destined for us, right? And it, it goes back to historical trauma with us being put into these box of physicality and sexuality, where what you do with your body, athletics in this time frame, but back then labor, and then how you perform sexually are the two areas that Black men are always conditioned around our identity. And so if you like, and like in today's world, if you like anime, I mean, video games are a little bit more uh, acceptable now, but 15, 20 years ago, girls couldn't play video games. That was weird. Mm -hmm. And if you spent all your time playing video games, you were considered to be lame or a bum or all those things like you. And then what type of games are you playing? You can't right. be playing Pokemon and 16 years old. You better be playing Madden and 2K. <laughs> Otherwise, something's wrong with you. Like, like that's right. what that's the mentality. Right. But it's true. But, there, but guess what? But there was dudes playing Pokemon that were 23 years old. They didn't let nobody know, right? They was in GameStop hiding what they was buying and stuff like that because we all, we have this box idea crafting our identity. So that would be high school. College, college for me, where I see that nurturing principle? It was probably two people, really one person, her name's Crystal. I still maintain contact with her too. She's a black woman. Um, Crystal gave me affirming love that I needed, but she gave it to me like, like a big sister or like mm. a, a auntie that was like, boy, you need to get your shit. <laughs> That's pretty much how, I mean, she literally said that to me. Um, in, in my second semester of freshman year, I was on academic probation. Cause when I went to the university of Minnesota, I was lying, telling everybody's on the football team. I was kicking it with football players. I was masking <laughs> my identity. Right. 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 I was partying, I was doing my thing and I was not studying because I just thought I was intellectually gifted and I didn't need to study because in high school, I didn't really, I mean, I, stuff just happened for me. I wasn't like, I didn't, I didn't, I'll be honest, I didn't work real hard, but I got good grades because I didn't need to. I was just smart enough to make stuff happen. But when I got to the University of Minnesota, that's a different level of understanding. I'm a first generation college student. I'm just happy to be on campus. I'm kicking it, I'm meeting girls. I didn't care about none of that. So I'm just thinking, that my grades are going to show up the same way. And then when I get that, the final grades get submitted, you know, and I'm, I've got like a, whew, like maybe like a 2.3 GPA. That was like a wake up call for me. Cause my GPA ain't never been that low at all. Like none of my academic things. So I had, um, Crystal was one of my counselors. I was on scholarship uh, for a program called Minor minority excellence program, which pretty much helped kids from the inner cities go to university within the state of Minnesota for free. So I had this special, she was my special multicultural counselor or whatnot. And she was like, look, Brandon, I got your grades, man. She was like, she just sat me down. She, I, she called me in her office. I shut the, she was like, shut that door. Shut the door, I sat down. She was like, look, man, I ain't gonna lie to you. I got your grades, man. She was like, it was hard as hell to get you in here. It's gonna be even harder to get you out of here. <laughs> Statistically, black, black, black men do not graduate college. We, she said, it's hard enough to get you in, but getting you out is even a bigger challenge. She's like, right. you need to graduate. And she's like, and you need to graduate in four years. And I'm here to help you get this, but you got to want it. And she was, and then she said, you need to get your shit together. <laughs> like she just, I mean, she just dropped it on me, but she had to do it like that because it resonated. Cause that's what, I mean, sadly in our community, that's what resonates with us. And I right. remember that so vividly, like, damn, she's not playing. Like, she's not just saying, Brandon, figure it out. She's saying, dude, like, this is, this is not life or death, but this is serious. Get right. your shit together. And I thought that that was love right there. Cause I walked out of there with a whole new mentality and a whole new determination and focus because she pulled me to the side, quote unquote, to, in her office and said, look, dude, I see you bro, but I wanna see you here and I need you to get there. So, so those would be the examples that I've had throughout my educational career. And they've all come in these pockets where I've had these aha moments of other people seeing me and validating either my existence, my intelligence, my capabilities, they gave me some type of nurturing that I wasn't giving myself and they brought it to my awareness. Right. I think that for me, I've only seen that in elementary school and high school mm. and like elementary school, I think I've seen it um, only because I saw it in my teacher. Like, you know how like some kids are really like receptive of what's going on with adults. Yeah. Like 
my teacher was going through a lot like in fourth grade I remember her name is Reese and she was so cool but the thing is is like it was just like you could kind of feel um as a student like okay she's going through something maybe I could feel that because I'm going through something you know what I mean and so mm -hmm. she was like I validated her she validated me so it was kind of like she wanted to do extracurriculars outside of school and like you know she took me to my first basketball game like I've never wow. been to a basketball game and so it was just like all these different things and then um she was just really interested in um me and nobody's ever yeah. in elementary school like it's fourth grade you're about to be in middle school like from kindergarten, I feel like up until then, it's like kind of like, you're just like, oh, you're just, you know, you're just a little black girl, you do your work, whatever, you know? <laughs> and I, and I always been like a person that was like, really, I knew that I was smart. And maybe because my grandma instilled that into me before I went to elementary school. Like, she was like, I'm going to teach you everything. And you can go in there and you're gonna be just as smart as those other kids. And it was just like, so it's like, I kind of had to prove myself all the way up until the fourth grade, when the fourth grade teacher was like, oh, yeah, yeah, you are smart. Like everybody else is just kind of like, you know, um, yeah, you, you are all right. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, no, I'm smart as hell. Like yeah. you better you recognize. Yeah. And so it was really nice to have somebody just to be kind of like a kid, like just to be in the class and just be like, okay, now I don't have to prove myself so much. Maybe I can play around. I was real mm -hmm. talkative, but they used to have those um, parent teacher days or parent mm -hmm. days when they, your parent would come in and see yep. what you're doing in class. Do you remember? Yep. Did you have that? Yeah, but my mama never came. Uh, <laughs> I had him, but nobody showed up. <laughs> my mom came and she was so mad at me. I was like, I was like, this is my favorite class, my best teacher. Like, I get to chill. So I was just talking. And my mom was like, you ain't learning nothing. Like, she was mm. going off. But anyway, my teacher mm. was, I liked her. And I felt like, damn, I've been learning this long. Let me get a break. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but so after that, middle school was, uh, rough. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Middle school was a horrible experience for me. So I kind of didn't, you know, you just keep your head down, you just go through the motions and mm -hmm. you get to high school. And then high school, I didn't really have a teacher that really kind of embodied that. I had um, this guy, he was a, uh, I th he was a psychologist, but he was a psychologist for the special needs students. Mm -hmm. And his name was Dr. Byron Douglas. And the only reason I remember him is because being from where I'm from in Michigan, it's like predominantly white or other, not necessarily black because mm -hmm. they pushed all the black people out of my hometown. Mm -hmm. And the thing is, is just like, he was, he just stuck out. And since he was a psychologist, he made sure that he allowed that his door to be open to the black students that were going through it in, yeah. in high school, because nobody else was really there. Like, you, I mean, you had Black administrators, but they were either married to people that were not Black, so they kind of mm -hmm. couldn't really, like, get in the, like, the nitty gritty of, like, what's going on in your life. And then mm -hmm. you had other counselors that were not Black at all. So it's just like, you know, here's somebody that's, you know, white identified or Arab identified trying to tell you about your hood problems and your right. Black problems. And you're like, look, bro, you're not understanding. Right. And this is a man that, like, they literally tried to get rid of him, like, several mm. times because of his influence and just how he just right. kind of you know helped these black students like make it through high school like wow. all you had to do was go to his door he didn't even have to make no appointment he was in there yeah. you could sit down he'll close the door start talking to you if not mm. he'll be like I'll be you know I'll see you in a minute or catch me after second hour or whatever and then if you were late he'd give you a hall pass like it was mm. not like he was trying to like um just beat up on you more than what the right. teachers and stuff were doing so I saw him as somebody as being, you know, embodying that sacred feminine. Obviously he was a man. And so he embodied masculine qualities too, but he was the first person I actually, I wanted, I was like, man, I want to be just like him, man. I want to be Dr. D man. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, like yeah. he, he, he was that dude and he, you know, he went to Howard and like, here he mm -hmm. is in, you know, this, this all white town, he has a black wife and all these women are like, you know, he told me one time that they were at a teacher's um, gathering or something, you know, staff meeting or whatever before school starts. He said that these women were all gathered around him and he was just basically like, you know, talking to them, small talk. And they were like, mm -hmm. where's your wife? And he's like, oh, she's in the restroom. You know, when she comes out, I'll introduce you guys. And they were like, okay, cool. And so she was coming down this hill. And so he saw her. So he pointed out to her like, oh, that's my wife. Here mm -hmm. she comes. And they all turned and they were like, that's your wife? 
Yeah. And like, he was like, Shock. yeah, what's wrong with that? And they were mm-hmm. like, he thought your wife would be white because you yeah. work in the school system, you're yeah. success, you know. So I think that he embodied like that, that fiery energy of like that masculine action side because you've never right. seen anything like that. But then he also was very nurturing in the way and compassionate and receptive in the way that sometimes you just needed to take a, a catch a breath. Like you're just right. like, you know, these kids got 20, 20 pound backpacks on their back stressing out. <laughs> like, you know what I'm saying? Like it was, right. it was ridiculous. And so that's, that. those are the two people that I can think of, but um mm-hmm. And um, actually, I can think of one more person in college. It was Dr. Richardson. She was also somebody that was like, you're really smart. Like, I, I see you. I, yeah. I think that you should join my sorority. I wasn't for that. I wasn't for yeah. <laughs> I was like, I'm my own person. I'm not trying to be all like, I was like, what's these rules? Like, no, nah, I'm not doing that. But she was just like, oh, you're so great. Like, you should you should join. And so she was awesome. But she, um, she ended up leaving the school and moving around. But... Mm-hmm. I still followed her around and um, talked to her a little bit, but she's she's doing great. She's administrator now, and she's all she's nice. ever taught was a, at HBCUs. She's never wow. like went to any other schools. Nice. She a Delta? No, nah, she's a Sigma. Gamma. Okay. <laughs> That's what my um, mom's friend. She was like, "If you pledge anything, you gotta pledge that." And I was like, "I'm not pledging nothing. I'm pledging yeah. natural fine natural." You see my hair, <laughs> purple and green. I was, like, <laughs> I was on the same thing. Like I was never in the frets. Uh, it's just a different culture here in in the Twin Cities with the fraternities. And I've been down south and I was able to see it. Um, so I knew it was very different. So I was like, yeah, I'm going to stay. If I'm not going to go to HBCU, I ain't messing with it. So, right. yeah. And so I guess my follow-up question then is when you've seen all these embodiments with those individuals that you said, or even just like in your life, like just thinking about the things that you could work better on, like which embodiment or aspect of the sacred feminine do you feel like you could be better at or you would like to work on yeah so for me especially being a psychologist yeah yeah you know automatically just kind of I guess this might be naturally it goes to me being a parent and then and and I only have daughters at the moment so um I know that my parenting style with them uh, highlight some of the feminine principles that I need to improve because my wife is good at pointing those things out. <laughs> She's like, dude, you're just a little too rough on these girls sometimes. And I and and I, and as I reflect on that, I agree. And now, actually, both of I was gonna say my oldest, but both of them give me really good feedback on like things that I say to them or how I treat them. Like one thing that I'm very proud of uh, for both me and my wife is that. We've really developed our, our emotional intelligence and our kids pretty high to the point where it's a little annoying where they, where they come and tell us like, daddy, you didn't make me feel good when you said that. It's like, who are you? Like, like I don't care how I made you feel. Um, that, that's, what, that, that's where my mind goes. But then I'm like realizing like, no, this is where you want your kids to be. So for me, I think really like, I think renewal is probably one that definitely that I need to improve. I think I give so much that I don't take time to like restore myself fully. Um, I just, I'll do like little spurts here and there, but I need to like take more time off and just not do things. And, and I, I it's funny because before we started today, I was talking to my wife because she's working on a self-care book and, mm-hmm. and I looked at it cause she was just over there ch- chatting about something, talking to herself. And I was like, do you ever just stop trying to be well? Like your self-care is like every day. Like, but but that's what it's supposed to be. But I was I was kind of messing with her, but at the same time, I was just like, doesn't it just get exhausting when you're just talking about self-care all the time? Um, and but for her, it's not because she has to do that to restore. Right. I don't do that very well. It's very important. I, I just keep moving, I just keep moving. Um, but that's that masculine drive, right? It's like, you know, you got tasks to do, you got to execute, you got to just keep moving forward. Um, so I really need to work on that renewal piece. Um, and my daughters would tell me that too, like, dad, do you have a call today? Because, you know, we're in this virtual space now. Are you are you going to be doing a podcast today? Are you going to be on the call? Um, and then like, even yesterday, um, I was going to be doing some work, but then I just stopped. I said, let's go, let's go. It was It was sunny outside. I said, girls, get your shoes on. Let's go um, take a walk. 
And then the walk went to, we ended up at a park and we just chilled at the park for like an hour. And then, you know, we chilled, we talked, we played, and then they were just like, all right, I'm ready to go home. And then we just walked home. But <laughs> that typically wouldn't happen without me planning it. It wouldn't just be mm. the spontaneous action of let's just go. But that was, to me, that was renewal. Even though I was still giving to my daughters, it was a, it was a moment for me to disconnect from feeling like I needed to work and just right. be in space. Um, right. And that's probably the biggest thing that I need to work on. And how, I mean, how do you... I mean, with you being like a taskmaster, how do you tell yourself, hey, Brandon, it's time to slow down? Yeah, I have to schedule time <laughs> off. Because <laughs> I, so I, I use the my issue as or my, I guess it's a strength to work on my weakness. So I will schedule time off. So like at the end of this month, I have two days where I'm be off. And one of the days I'm thinking about just going to a hotel just to be completely isolated. Because I just, right. I mean, in quarantine, we've been together all the time now my daughters are back in school full time now and they have been for a few weeks but we just ended spring break so like we need a disconnect my wife needs some time in herself I need some time to myself so I was like you know I think I'm gonna leave the house and just give you this space and we've did this before where our daughters went to the in-laws my wife went to the hotel and I stayed home but we're trying to I was like we should reverse it this time and then I just get out of here and I think that's healthy um, yeah. Some people don't have those financial means to spend a hundred dollars to go to a hotel, but scheduling that time off for yourself is important, whether it's just going for a drive or going to sit outside or whatever. I think that's a good way for you to just find that time. And, and it's, it's a good practice to take care of yourself. Yeah. It's like, like checking in with you, like, Hey, right. how are you doing today? Yep. <laughs> yeah. Yep. yeah. Okay, so my next question is, when did tapping into these embodiments of the sacred feminine not work or went wrong? Like you showed compassion and somebody just went the hell off on you. (laughs) Dating. (laughs) (laughs) I can think of some exes that I've been with. But were you being truly tapped into your sacred feminine or you was trying to play games? That's the question. Oh, what if I was doing both? <laughs> what was a combination of both? No, I think I'm going to think of a real example where I wasn't trying to like run any game. Okay. Um. Yeah, I've been played before. I remember, I remember this is one of my first, this is my second real serious girlfriend. I dated her off and on pretty much senior year of high school broke up when I went to college because she didn't trust me got back together and then when we broke up the second time this is when this is when I was using the feminine principle piece but it backfired so she didn't go to college right away she and I ended up going to school right away and then she ended up um just working just working after high school and we had broke up the summer that I left for school no, we were together. We broke up like right when school started. And then I was single. And then we got back together, like in the springtime, like April, May. And she was getting ready to move into her own place. <laughs> it's funny, because I'll never forget get how crazy this was. And I was so confused on what happened. So she's moving into her own place for the first time. She's moving out from living with her mom. And it's the summertime. So school's getting ready. And I'm living on campus. I don't have anywhere really to live because over the summer, unless you take a summer school, the dorm shut down. So naturally, I should just come stay with you, which she wanted me to. She was like, oh, you can help me pay rent, all this stuff, right? So I'm like, bet, let's make this happen. And I remember helping her move in, literally move in day. Her mom calls her. I'm sitting here, we're moved all this stuff in. Uh, we're getting ready to paint and all this stuff. And I hate painting. And her mom calls and her mom is going off on her on the phone. You got this nigga living with you, yada, yada, yada. She's going off. And I can hear all of this on the phone. And I'm like, why is her mom tripping? Like, I don't even, me and her mom have always had a great relationship. And I'm like, I'm a good dude. I'm in college. I work a job. Like, I'm not here living off your daughter. If anything, she's, I'm helping her. I stand with her. And I don't know what happened, but I don't know if it was because we broke up and then we got back together or what, but my level of compassion and trying to help her move in advance. And then I was also trying to help her get in school and all this stuff. And that one phone call with her mom, her whole mentality just like switched over. Like she got off that phone and it was like, we were in this combative relationship all of a sudden. And I'm sitting there like, whoa, 
Like, where is this coming from? I'm not here to live off you. I'm not here to do any of that. So we went through, like, we didn't break up at that moment. We stayed together. But what ended up happening was, <laughs> this is crazy because I'm cool with this dude now. She ended up cheating on me with this dude that I'm cool with. So I was real surprised why he even did it. Um, but she tried to play it off very, like, so we had this friend group. Like, it was like the dudes who date, the dudes were all cool who dated all these girls. And we were part of this group. So one of the girls, she they had went out one night together, and then they both had came back to the to the apartment, and I was there. So it was like super late. She was supposed to be back like way sooner than what she actually did. So I'm like, my intuition's kicking in, like something's not right. Like this is weird. So I like hit her up, see like, yeah, you all right? I'm texting her. This is right when cell phones people start getting their own phones. I'm like you good? Like what's going on? She don't really hit me back. Um, she sent me like some weird text message later. So I'm like, something ain't right about this. So then she gets back to the crib with her friend. I'm like, why is her friend here? And it's like three, four o'clock in the morning. So it's something super late, right? And I'm like, what is going on? And she was like, oh, we just went out and then whatever. I'm like, something ain't right. And then literally like the next morning, all the truth came out. I was like, she was with this dude. They were at the, his house or whatever. And I'm just like, oh, I got played. I got super played. <laughs> And here I am trying to be compassionate, understanding. <laughs> I'm thinking I'm the good dude, but I got I got played, and I had to I had to I had to break up with her at that point. But it was right. like I was doing everything I thought I was supposed to be doing, right. but it wasn't enough. And I, and I also think that her the her mom's influence on her had a huge role in it. And her mom probably had issues with other dudes, and it just just reminded her of some situation that she was in. Because I never showed any type of display to even be playing her daughter or nothing. And I'm like, I'm, I'm supposed to be checking all these boxes of what you want your daughter to date. Like the, the dude who's going to college, he's got his own job, he's got his own car. Like I could have had my own apartment, but I just figured I'll live with my girlfriend because that makes the most sense. So so that'd be a time where I, <laughs> where it all got messed up when I was tapping into something and I ended up uh, getting my heart broken, we'll say that. <laughs> yeah, I just, I think that um, we forget that our parents have such a like, a strong influence on us and we forget yeah. too that our parents were raised in this paradigm where their energies are not balanced right so it's kind of like you might be the most you know tapping into that sacred feminine and be the most compassionate genuine loving unconditional person and then all of a sudden you know here's this this masculine action girl you need to do something because you know what you about to do you know yeah. it's just and it's unfair in a lot of ways because um it doesn't allow for the, the child in question or the, she's not a child, but at the time, right. but you there know, the person We're like 19, 20 years old. Yeah. It doesn't allow her to kind of like feel it out for herself or listen to her own intuition or, Oh, well, look what he's doing or look at Brandon, you know, right. he's helping me with this. And so I, I feel like that it, it messes things up. I think that the one time I won't say one time, I'm pretty sure there's more times, but the time that I can remember is, when I was in high school, I was friends um, on and off with this uh, this one um, this one girl, and she it cracks me up because she she was always like like she had like I'll say that when I was growing up, I didn't have a lot, so it was kind of like I would always be friends with people that had a little bit more than me. Plus, where I lived and the school system I went to, it was like mm -hmm. always everybody having more than me anyway. But I was always like the person that you know, kind of picked on myself and like joked around and stuff like that. So people kind of were like, oh, you're always so happy. You're so lively. You know, you're always like, like I was really outgoing, like in the same way, kind of like you, I would go to these different groups because I wanted to learn so much from other people. Right. And it was kind of like when I got done with uh, that group is because I felt like I couldn't learn anything. I'm like, oh, right. what's going on over here? You know what I'm saying? So this, it was this one individual um, young lady. She was basically like, uh, the person that you know had the car and she was like you can have all my hand-me-downs stuff like that and I was like all right mm -hmm. bet you know you got some nice clothes so I was just like I you know wore all her old clothes that she had but you know I was just like the type of person I was it was just like people were like hey man you want to go to this party let's go over here you know my parents gonna be gone whatever and so I'm just like yeah bet you know but my ride is this young lady right, right. and it's not the fact that she wasn't like cool but it was just kind of like she was awkward yeah. So it was just like people will be trying to dock her out, but I know like all the things that she's done for me, like helping me, like going back and forth to work because we worked at the same job or mm -hmm. if we were playing the same sport. It was like she, you know, would drive, you had the car and stuff like that. And so 
I um, would always tell people like, I can't go unless you invite her too, because she's mm-hmm. my ride and she's my friend. And they're just like, oh, okay, whatever, yeah. you know, not necessarily wanting to, but doing it. And so I remember like, it was just like this one time she just was like going off on me, like basically just talking about how I wasn't nothing and mm. like how, and she's a white girl, by the way, too. So she, was, <laughs> so she was just basically talking about like, you know, like all these people love her and, you know, she's mm. friends with all these popular people. And I was just like, you don't even know, you don't even know yeah. the side conversations and yeah. the little like arrangements that I had to make <laughs> yeah. for you to be like in this this party and be with these people like I don't and honestly to me I'm the type of person like I'll go and have fun but once it gets to a point where I'm just like I'm not having fun or I don't I can't learn anything I'm out like I can be on some like hermit like you know stage do from like you know in my (laughs) own space because it's just like if it doesn't interest me it doesn't so we will always have these falling outs then she would just be going off trying to build a little confidence. I was like, you know, I ain't gotta, mm. you know, mess with you no more. So I just start <laughs> talking to other people, hanging out. Then all of a sudden I know where people, oh, she misses you. You know, she's sorry for what happened. Yeah. And I'm just like, what in the world is going on? So then I would just be like, all right, let's be cool again. Like it was yeah. just this weird back and forth, but I was really trying to show her compassion because I've been in her house. I know how her family is. And I know mm. that even though, you know, everything that glitters ain't gold. Like she did not have a good life, even though she had things, you know what I mean? But it was just kind of like it backfired because it was just kind of what her insecurities were. And I was just kind of like, look, I'm your friend. Like I would never make you feel like you weren't who you think that you are in your mind. But you know, it's just like, it's, if it's, if she feels like, and I think it too had something to do with the fact that I was black because Mm -hmm. it was just like, these groups were not, predominantly black children these were like preppy mm. kids that played lacrosse and mm. their parents were surgeons and stuff like that so she's just like how are you getting invited to these parties and, and you live on this side wow. of the town you know what I mean so <laughs> right it yeah. was just it was that's just how it was so that that definitely backfired mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah wow and so, yeah I think no I think it's um a lot of times when it backfires just because of other people's own insecurities um because both of our stories even though we the one we're both the people that got burned in the situation it was really due to the other person just not being sure of what they wanted or how they felt about how other people were you know understanding them or whatever the case may be and i think that's what happens when you do show that feminine side quote unquote is that sometimes sometimes people take that for granted or they take it as a weakness and then it can manipulate you which i think it's probably why a lot of men don't utilize it is because that vulnerability puts us into these uncomfortable spaces emotionally and we haven't developed the capacity to deal with them so we just shut it off um so yeah that's true and i think that women too i mean mm. if you think about it like i mean both of them were not even tapping into like hold up let me check myself like this person has been here for me this person has you know stood up for me or whatever so um I'm going to ask, where can you see um, these embodiments the most within the education system? Did you see it the most in elementary school? Did you see it the most in middle school, high school, college? That is a great question. I would probably say elementary school. And I think that that's a lot just due to the nature of how people care about children. Even, Even when we know that there's disparities and there's incidents that happen, racist stuff that happens to Black children, I still think that the majority of people who go into education do really care about kids. Mm-hmm. Um, so you'll see, you know, you'll see the school psychologist or the teacher's aide or the behavioral deans now that they have in the hallways. Like you'll see them looking out for kids. And you'll also see compassion from other kids onto other kids. Now we know bullying happens and that takes place, but there's probably more compassion in schools than there is actually bullying. Um, there's more of that intuition that takes place Oh, that somebody's hurt. And I see it even in my own children. Like when their friends are having tough times, my daughters can hold that. And they'll come tell us like, you know, my friend, you know, she was sad today. And it's like, well, what happened? Well, um, she was, her mom promised that she was going to do something and she couldn't do it. And it's like, and she's like, I should write her a card. It's like, it's like, that's, that's how my kids are. And I'm so like, nice. they want to help people. It's like, that's nice. I'm like, you don't have to write her no damn card because her mom didn't do something for her. That's her mom's problem. <laughs> but I understand your concern. But I think that's mm. how kids are, though. Like, they feel that empathy um, and that kind of caring. And, that, and they have that intuition that something's not right. 
And I think that schools, the school, how schools are set up is to tap into that and to connect with that. Yeah. And then somehow they beat it out of them or they <laughs> all of a sudden yeah. don't see it anymore. Middle school. I think middle school <laughs> starts to beat it out because think about it though. Middle school, what happens? Um, youth, young people start to develop, their brains go through what's called a pruning process. I'm not gonna get too deep on this, but what ends up happening is as people, as you develop, when you get into those middle school years, so 11, 12, 13 years old, mm -hmm. your, start, your brain is starting to develop what it feels like it needs for survival. It's, it's what's called a synaptic pruning process. So in, high, in middle school, what happens? You start to form an identity. You start to socialize around that identity. You start to differentiate yourself between who you are and other people are. So then you get the goth kids or the athletes or the creatives or the bullies. Like you start to put the loners, you start to figure out where do you fit? Now, some kids will hop around like we did, but most kids kind of just like pick a spot that feels comfortable and they just stay there. Even if, the, even if their interests start to change, things like that, they'll stay there. So what ends up happening is you start to formulate differences between groups. So now I'm this, so I can't be that. And a lot of that feminine, you know, principal piece starts to get questioned because you have to stay true to your group. And high school is just hey, an elevated process. True. Yeah, that's high school true. is just an elevated process to that. You know, if you, I mean, I'm sure there's probably somebody in high school or you know somebody personally who did a completely 180 shift from middle school to high school. It's like that person was not like that in middle school. And now they're <laughs> a completely different person in high school. And then the crazy part is if you go to high, if you go to college, people you went to high school with, sometimes they completely re reinvent themselves too. Like we talked about uh, frats and sororities earlier. Another reason why I stayed away from frats is because the dudes that I went to college with that I went to high school with, a lot of those dudes were lames and, mm. and, and, and everybody knew their lames. And then they joined, they were Kappas and Alphas. <laughs> and now these dudes became somebody. And I remember like, dude, you was the lamest dude in high school. And now you're somebody cause you're with this group. Yeah, I can't be mad at that, but I always thought that, that was fake. So I always stayed away from it. But me and my friend, me and my friend, Chris, we always talk about that. Like, man, we know so many dudes that were just trash in high school. And it just became like people, they became like the it people because they joined the fraternity. It's the craziest dynamic. And it's a false, it's a false thing. And that's not trusting that sacred feminine. You're, you know, trusting yourself basically is, and who you are and who in your embodiment is like, if you, and not to say that they were lame, maybe y'all just didn't see what was going on with in them. In high school, whatever. they were classified as lames. Okay. I'm not saying they're lame people, but that was the, like when people, right. when we think back about it, like, man, that dude was so corny. <laughs> or his, like he didn't wear, he didn't have, you know, a Nietzsche jeans or whatever. Right. He didn't have iceberg sweaters. That's what he was wearing back in the early 2000s. But he didn't have that. He didn't have the, he was still wearing FUBU jerseys and stuff. Like nobody was wearing that stuff. <laughs> well, maybe, I mean, I, I get it. I feel like the thing is, is um, I've always felt like it's kind of like a, a forced way to have friends, mm -hmm. you know, and, 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 you know, what, but what do I know? You know what I'm saying? Like, I'm just, I'm still out here learning. So, you know, maybe it's some opportunity that I miss there, but I just, I feel like um, for me personally, I like that what you said about the elementary where you see it the most. Mm -hmm. To me, I, I, I feel like, I don't know. Like, I feel like I, I remember like specific situations with my brother in elementary school that I feel like I can't feel like the compassion and not necessarily from like the other students, Sure. But like from the teachers, like I just noticed that was such a difference between how I, I was treated and how my brother was treated because we're mm. 18 months apart. Mm. And so he was like, and then he got held back in a grade and it was all, and he was like, he was quiet. Like he, not like me, like I'm always like, you know, talking and walking around and stuff like that. Mm. Like my brother was very quiet and very like, like when he first went to kindergarten, right? We call him LaDaren at home because that's his middle name. So we're mm -hmm. like, LaDaren, LaDaren, you know, like, isn't it so great? Look at your cubby. Oh, look mm -hmm. at the, look at your desk. Blah, blah. And so the teacher came up to him and she saw on the paper that his name said Leroy Spencer. Mm -hmm. And so she was like, oh, what are they calling you? And, he, you know, my mom's like, oh, we call him LaDaren at home because, you know, that's his middle name. Mm -hmm. And she was like, do you want us to call you LaDaren too? And my brother looked at her with the serious face of like an, <laughs> A 60 year old man and was like yeah. no you call me Leroy yeah. like, I do not know you I'm not about to be nice to you and so I was just cracking up because it was just like 
it's, he had that energy maybe that he brought with him because people sure. teachers were not nice to him and I was just like mm-hmm. he's like the cool like I'm not saying that he was like cool when we was younger with kids and you play mm-hmm. oh you know stuff like that you're lame I hate you or you know you love them at home but it's like how did he have such a different experience in education and I know how but it's still kind of like nah if you're gonna be nice to me be nice to him right like I, I didn't see that so I I feel like elementary is like mm, maybe but it was sure. pockets that I feel yeah. like the, the embodiment wasn't there but I feel like the embodiment to me I was being like a smart ass when I wrote the answer down <laughs> but I was like the embodiment was in college because you pay for it and it's your major <laughs> like oh yeah I'm, you know I'm extra like feminine extra you know sure Tapping. And not to say that you can't learn those qualities. I, college is all about learning, but I feel like the administrators and the people that are in, in that specific uh, modality or specific major, they have to embody it. I mean, you're getting paid to work in the department that unless talks you, about. I would agree with that to a certain extent, unless you have <laughs> opposing views. So mm. like, so like I was a sociology major in undergrad and I remember like being in my classes questioning everything because I remember I was a nurse I read a lot even though I wasn't the best reader I read a lot of the stuff even before I even got to college so I was familiar with stuff so like when we're in there talking about race or we're in there talking about gender or sexuality I'm the kid that's gonna raise his hand and ask a question like well why are we thinking like this or or is that really true is that really how things are and when you oppose teach because think about college you have a professor that's set up who's supposed to be the expert and you have students and usually there's going to be those students who don't know anything so they're just whatever you tell them they're going to go with then you have those students who kind of know a little bit and they're going to agree with the teacher because they want to be in teacher's favor and then you have those there's a few of those students who are just going to oppose everything i was usually in the oppose everything category (laughs) so like so now i'm not fighting with the instructor because i'm not saying i know more than my teacher but I'm fighting with the other students who are like riding with the teacher, no matter what the teacher says. So now we're getting into these like debates in class. And I felt like that wasn't nurturing. And I would, and sometimes I would just suppress what I thought too, depending on what class I was in. Because as a black male, I'm the only one with my perspective, usually because I'm the only one in my damn class <laughs> with, you know, as a black male. And I'm with all these white females, a couple white dudes, a couple Asians. But it's like, it might be me and maybe about two or three other black people. Most of the time there was going to be black women. And even then there'll be opposing views on things. It's like, okay, here we go. I'm not trying to fight with the, the only allies culturally that I have in the class. I ain't trying to argue with y'all. Right. I'm trying to, I'm trying to link up. So um, I think that that's typically true. Go ahead. I was just going to add to you. I think that that's interesting because you're in this, this major of sociology. Social work is supposed to be a very yep. like, nurturing and mothering and yeah. receptive you know field and when I was fluttering around trying to figure out what my master's was going to be I did like a teacher education kind of major social foundations of education and it was all these teachers in there and they were mostly white women and they were aggressive yeah. they were very yeah. aggressive very masculine <laughs> and it's just like you sit there and you're just thinking like okay so you're the ones that are going to go out into the world and teach right. children and you know, be these social workers and help these families in these dire situations. But you're judgmental, you're bigoted, you're yep. cl- rigid, closed-minded. Like, how are you supposed to be yeah. tapping right. into the sacred feminine? And then the thing right. is, is like when you say these things or you you try to bring in a different um, a different perspective, it's all of a sudden like, can I see you after class? <laughs> yep, yep, and I. And I think since they're so, since I, and I've seen that, and I see that in my field because I'm around social workers and stuff all the time. I think that's why they end up getting burnt out so quickly and they need so much self care and they need so much reassurance is because that they're, they have this disposition that might be unnatural to the, them as just beings. Right. Um, and that, <laughs> that, I'm trying not to get too deep, but when you are, taking on that disposition of all that masculine energy and you're a woman and you're a female being that can be exhausting because you're over you're overcompensating in one element of yourself versus the other and i think that's why they end up getting burnt out because they're i mean literally they're competing with themselves and they're taking on this kind of masculine principle because that's where they learned it from like you said you started off talking about how school set up from a masculine principle which is true and 
since they're doing that and they're taking on this more masculine frame and doing this stuff, they're not naturally, their they're they're animas are <laughs> not developed for that. So they end up getting stressed out by it. And, right. and then this is why you see the self-help industry as one of the, the hugest genres because so many people end up overexerting themselves do that. And I think that when it comes to professionals like social workers, it's, it's awful. Um, and it's not just because they deal with difficult clients and they're helping families and helping young people, stuff like that. It's because they're trying to maintain this professional life. And then they still got to maintain their homes if they have kids or partners or whatever themselves. And it's this, it's, it's almost like taking the concept of the double shift and adding an additional layer to it. And if people don't know about the double shift, it's a feminine, a feminist concept of how women are just like gender studies concept of how women have to work at outside in the, in the world and, <laughs> and then also have to work in the home to maintain both, which adds this additional layer of pressure to them. So I guess my last question, I know I didn't add this, but I, I know we said that we wanted to kind of uh, have a millennial perspective and because we're both millennials, but like, what yeah. do you think as a collective is a nurturing quality that we need in our specific um, millennial category? <laughs> mm, good question. Good question. Let me think. I think we're, I think as millennials, we're pretty creative i think we may overcompensate on the compassion um to be honest i think we're just a little too compassionate sometimes mm -hmm. intuition renewal mis uh mystery i think receptivity is probably the one that we need to work on as millennials mm -hmm. and i say that because where we are currently in this current space, and it's really driven by millennials and then the generations behind us, is we're not really receptive to opposing viewpoints. We've yeah. been conditioned to be like, what you like or what you enjoy, you should overcompensate in that area. So you should listen to podcasts in the area. You should follow the thought leaders in that area. You should buy t-shirts with those types of pro messages and you should not consider any alternative thought. I think as millennials, we've lost the ability to be objective and to see things from many different perspectives. Um, and this is where you get cancel culture because every damn thing out here is getting canceled. And I've said this before, at some point, people are going to try to come cancel me. I know, because it's just how everything happens. And if you have a voice and you're trying to build a platform, somebody's not going to like what you say. I'm sure there's some stuff I said today, ain't nobody going to like, and they're going to come for you. And at some point, as millennials and the generations behind us, we have to be able to develop more objectivity um, and be able to see things from different directions and not just try to get rid of things that we uh, disagree with. I don't think that that's healthy. I don't think that that promotes critical thinking. And I think that is, is damaging because you stay on a one track mind and then you feel like the other, you know, other people or other things that are opposed to that have to be canceled. They have to be, you know, eradicated, get rid of it. And that, I don't think for us to move forward as a society, we should do that. And 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 when, when we're talking about millennials, I'm mainly talking about black folks, but all millennials, because us, we get caught in that all day. Mm -hmm. Like right away, if somebody has an opposing view, they are self-hating, they're a coon, they're, you know, they're a bed wench, like they're all these things. It's like, there's no room to have just a little bit of a difference. Like you have to stay right. in this lane or this box. And that doesn't do well for development. Like you can't develop a nation. If we can talk about nation building, you can't develop a nation like that because there's people who have different things. And there's people who are going to bring different perspectives that you may need for your civilization to move forward. I think that to piggyback on what you just said about millennials and the um, and that aspect, I think that I feel like the mystery part is connected to that because if people are let, allowing you to know what they're not being objectional, then obviously you know what side they're already on. So it's right. kind of like where's the mystery and I get it like everything we have is like tapped into you know our phones you know everything Alexa she know everything you know whatever right. but it's kind of like how do you grow up um 
with all these things, especially the generations after us, but because of us too, because we were the first ones to have, you know, AOL and stuff like that. It's kind of like, how do you disconnect so people can kind of feel like, oh, I wonder what's going on with Brandon. I wonder what's going on with, you know, Aaron, what are they doing? You know, like, how is it, like, do you keep, that you keep a private part of yourself that Mm. it's like, that you'll always have? you know so mm-hmm. i think that we need to bring that mystery back too i mean and the mystery is the best person in the movie anyway everybody's all like well <laughs> what are they Who about oh, <laughs> yeah yeah you know yeah <laughs> that's a great point i mean there are many of us that our whole lives are on display yeah you know, i'm a big proponent yes. of transparency but that doesn't mean that everything about me or everything about what i do needs to be on full display i share a lot of stories about my life and stuff because i think that's a good way for people to learn and understand context but there's stuff that people have no idea about me and that's important i keep that to myself and the folks that know that um and and everybody should have that we don't have to display everything the sad part about it aaron is we we have our gen part of our generation and the generations behind us they're so into there let me say it this way they're lacking that mystery portion so bad that they see what other people have and they desire it and then they get lost in it and this is why you see people who are having these like social media mental health crises where you know they see somebody else having things and now they have depression or now you're suicidal because everybody life life looks great online but yours doesn't and i feel like without having that that kind of agency or security in your own identity, you will get lost in this generation because there's so many different things that are hitting us literally at our fingertips. Um, It's it's, it's very fascinating concept. Well, I mean, those are all the questions that I have for today. I just want to end that um, we'll be back. (laughs) We have- We will be back. We have other topics that we're going to talk about with the sacred feminine. And I just thank you for allowing me to share this Mm -hmm. platform with you oh absolutely this is our platform we are doing this together so this has been the first episode of the listening eye trusting the sacred feminine within yes we will have these conversations about understanding those deeper parts of yourselves to help us grow move forward and build i am brandon jones you are aaron j dubos and we will see you next time peace